Well, hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for that introduction and uh, for bearing with us. Just as we, uh, you know, I just throw, threw Roseanne into this <laughs> this afternoon. So, you know, we've uh, we chatted through our, but uh, we've worked together for a very long time. And I think that uh, we'll have some good things to share with you all. Um, you know, I, I've been, I've been in the industry for, for quite a while and I've worked with um, all kinds of authors and, um, you know, the authors that, that seem to be attracted to Wise Inc. are, are people who are purpose-driven. And I think that's never more true than, than for children's book authors. And, um, you know, I, I have a few books with me today that I, that I will share some stories about, but um, I've really been inspired by the way that uh, our children's book authors in particular have um, aligned their book with a really specific mission in the world and um, you know, with the idea that, that these books can create change. So we wanna talk a little bit about what that looks like and what, and what that means. And I think that it can be, some of these tactics can be harnessed for, for all genres, um, but um, it's really about thinking outside of the traditional retail models and thinking outside of, um, and really just going to the heart of, of where issues are showing up and you know where those people are congregating and you know helping people solve problems so um yeah Roseanne do you want to share a little bit about you and, and then yeah, we'll sure. go from there and, you know as Amy said we have known each other for a really long time worked together for a long time in the publishing world and I you know I don't need to remind everybody how difficult this year has been but I think that what I have certainly seen from the marketing side and in the publishing world in general is that um, it feels like a really uh, important time to be a creative person, whatever that means for you. And, um, you know, we all are at different states of um, being able to manage our lives, as you saw from my daughter coming to hang on me uh, before this call. So, you know, finding time for that creative work and finding time to to create some joy around getting your work out into the world um, is really challenging, but I also th think um, it might be more important and uh, more exciting than ever right now, particularly with this holiday season coming up where we probably still won't be able to be together. Um, we can connect through books and I think a lot, a lot of people know and feel that. So it's, um, I don't know, I think it's an exciting time to be, to be a writer especially a children's book yeah. writer. Um, and what I've learned in my work is that, you know, the best books are all um, communicating some sort of a transformation and they're all born out of some sort of a transformation. Um, and so, you know, first I wanna go into talking about how these creative ideas um, come about in the first place. Um, and I think it really, so oftentimes they come from a place of pain or they come from a place of, um, you know, addressing a very specific passion. So I wanted to share this book um, just to start. Um, this is called Lolo's Superpower. Um, and this is an example of a, of a book that, a children's book that I think is changing the world. And, and we'll talk through um, some of these tactics that these authors are taking a little bit, but I first wanna just talk about how this, how this idea came about. Um, this author, she, um, when she was six years old, she, she lost one of her legs in an accident um, and she um, had a, has a prosthetic limb that she's had for, you know, her entire life. Um, she had this idea for a nonprofit that was going to help kids get, um, who are disabled in um, under-resourced countries um, get their own prosthetic limbs. And so to build that nonprofit, you know, she, she also wrote this book as a medium through which this message could get out further. Um, and this little doll here um, has arms and legs that snap on and snap off. So she used her own experience and transformed it into this lovely little story that helps kids feel seen and help, helps kids um, you know, connect emotionally to um, to other situations, and so she's used this word, this book throughout the world, actually. But um, it's also a, a fundraiser for for this greater cause that she has. Um, and so this 
book really isn't doing a lot in traditional bookstores. Um, she's using the nonprofit to, to leverage the book and to leverage this mission and it all feeds each other. So that's just one example of, of how, you know, if you, if you can harness what, what your passion is and, and what your, um, uh, you know, where your, where your heart is, um, then it can be, it's easier to leverage that into, into a book that can make a difference. Um, Roseanne, do you want to I, add I mean, I just love that author so much. So I'm glad that you started with her um, because she's a great example of someone who um, really understands um, what her purpose is. Something I say to authors all the time is um, your book is an extension of you and not the other way around. Um, and so, you, you know, you really want to continue, you want to lead all of your um, book marketing efforts, no matter what your genre, but I think particularly with children's books, because you, you sort of have that added element of kind of you're selling to the parents and the grandparents more than you are selling to the child. And so, you know, in that case, you want to lead from, you know, to, to put it kind of in a, um, you know, an emotional way, like you, you want to lead from your heart and what brings you joy. And I think Leslie's a great example of an author who does that, you know, this, this book is, is a, uh, a piece of this big, big puzzle that she is a part of. And so, um, you know, I don't know how many of you on the call already have children's books out or are in the process of writing children's books, but I do think that one of the most valuable things you can do as an author is look at some of these children's books, book authors and see how they're putting themselves out into the world and how that might resonate for you. You know, um, maybe, maybe <laughs> starting a nonprofit is not gonna be the thing that you do, but you know, we've worked with many children's book authors who have taken over story times, um, who are doing now Zoom story times, I've seen those. Um, you know, they, I certainly did many, many classroom visits when I um, first had uh, my first two books come out. So, um, you know, in, in those ways, there's so many creative ways to get yourself out there. And it's really a way of, um, it's really a matter of leading with how you feel like you can be helpful and impactful and, you know, yeah. bring some joy out yeah. into. So world. Roseanne, you have two children's book or middle grade mm -hmm. books that you wrote mm -hmm. that, and I would say each of those came mm -hmm. from that place of passion um, in you or in a change that you wanted to see. Um, can you talk about how those ideas came about in the first place and how you harnessed um, harnessed your art for, for yeah, change? Yeah, I, I, I think it's actually, it's um, it, it seems like so long, long ago, it was really only about 10 years ago, but that's like light years in publishing. So it, it just it seems like a million years ago. But um, what had happened was I, um, I basically had this, I've always been kind of a writer and I had this idea for a book that was just sort of in my head. Um, I want, I was a teacher for a high school teacher for seven years. And um, I was thought, you know, my, my high school students did not understand the power of marketing um, and how they were constantly being marketed to. Um, so I kept thinking, gosh, you know, I should write a book about this. I should write a book about a school that takes corporate sponsors over federal funding and, and what money can buy in schools and what it can't buy in schools. And I wanted to, um, you know, create a book that was something that I would love to teach as a teacher. Um, you know, of course, like getting kind of nerdy about how long the chapters were, if they were homework length chapters and, you know, pulling out vocabulary and all that good stuff. Um, and I would say uh, what happened was, um, you know, as as creatives, we get it, we fall into this trap a lot where it was, I just kept pushing it off and pushing it off. And um, finally, when I, um, when I really sat down to write it, it was when I was um, pregnant with my, my son. And um, it was just kind of a, a rocky time I'm in my life at a very tumultuous pregnancy. And I remember thinking, gosh, if I don't, if I don't write this book now, um, I'm going to going to be on Google, um, Googling my condition and freaking myself out. So I better just like write the book. And I did. And what happened on the other side was, was that um, I connected with Dara at Wise Inc. who, who saw the potential in the book. And uh, um, I had gone around um, looking for an agent. I had um, several agents um, with a lot of interest in the book. And what ended up happening was 
they, I, I got this feedback from them saying, you know, we love the book. We think it's really well written, but we're not sure that we can sell it. And um, the reason was because, you know, there was no like drugs or sex, there was no vampires or anything like that. And um, when I talked to Dara and we really talked about what this book meant for me um, and how important it was to put it out there, I realized that I didn't need any of that other stuff. Uh, what, what I really needed was to get real with how I, I personally um, could put myself out there as an author. And you know, I'm, I'm not a famous person. I, I have no desire to be on the Today Show. What I really love is teaching kids. And so I figured, you know, once my book was published, um, how do I get my book in front of kids? Well, how about I just call some teachers and take over their classroom for a day? Um, and that's basically what happened. So I would, you know, call up a district and say, hey, you know, I've got this creative writing lesson and I'll teach you how to, um, you know, I'll teach your kids what it's like to put a book together. Here's what a, um, here's what it means to put your book cover together. The kids always love all the different editions of the book cover that come out um, and all the illustrations. They love asking how much money you've made. Um, I got that question many multiple times. Um, but really it was so much joy to be out there and put myself out there in that way. And I had spoken with other middle grade authors who were, they just hated classroom visits. So they were doing, you know, uh, big advertising campaigns on Amazon and on Pinterest, and they were doing other things. But for me, it started with um, where my joy was and where the, where the book started. And it was really in the classroom. So um, the, it sort of organically grew from there. Can you talk too about the, um, about the mission? And for that first book and what change you wanted to yeah. affect? Um, you know, I would say, gosh, when I re reach back and really think about the mission for that book, um, what I wanted was, I, I really felt strongly that um, our kids were being kind of saturated with um, sex and drugs at a really early age. And they, you know, it's not that they should be reading any books like that. I just um, wanted to give a, you know, Sort of quote unquote cleaner option. Um, and so I wanted to have um, a, a book that, again, that I felt like I could teach and that I would, would want to teach, but also that a parent would really want to read with their kid um, and, and spark some really cool conversations about um, bigger social issues. And, um, and that certainly was the theme in my second book as well about cyberbullying. So, um, I, you know, I wanted to, to spark bigger conversations. And so um, the, it, it's easy in this business to get really overwhelmed with all the things that other authors are doing um, and all the, the the ways that they're putting themselves out there. But for me, what worked was really focusing on that mission of, um, you know, talking about these social issues, getting families talking about these social issues in a way that is comfortable for them. Um, and then, um, you know, continuing my teaching career around it as well. Yeah. So with every book that we publish at Wise Inc., um, we are focusing in on on a very specific mission um, and being clear about that and identifying that from the very beginning. So, you know, and sometimes the, there isn't a lot of room for that in the creative process, but at, at the very least before you move into production, we wanna get that really clear because when we have a, cl a clear idea of what the mission is, um, we feel those are all the decisions we make in the production process through that mission. So, um, you know, having the mission of wanting to spark great conversations, that might mean, you know, putting discussion questions in the book. That's something that would, would affect or would impact the mission or would help further the mission. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think that having an idea of how you want a book to impact an audience, whether it's in big or small ways, um, means that you're going to be making the right decisions along the way. And it also, it also shifts what success looks like for the book. I know that there are some traditional publishers here and, um, you know, success is, is largely, you know, in how many copies you sell and in whether you can make a profit. And of course that all matters too. In independent publishing, we have a little more flexibility to, um, to decide for ourselves and help our authors decide what their success looks like. And, and it's it's really more based on 
you know, are we able to help the author achieve a mission versus are we able to make money? And if we can do both, then wonderful. Um, but we actually find that it's easier to make money when we keep the keep that mission um, at the forefront through the production process. Um, so, you know, another example, I did want to just share Ara's book because she's not here today, but, and you would have heard all about this, um, but this is Ara's gorgeous children's book, uh, Rise and Shine. And Ara really took, um, she really took a, a different route with, with launching and marketing this book. So I want to talk you through um, how that went a little bit. So she came to me, um, she had worked on another one of our, of our author's books um, as an artist. And she came to me with this beautiful poem that she had written um, reflecting uh, on all of the, the darkness and the division um, in our country and in our people after the after the 2016 election and she said you know i want to write something or i want i want a book that is going to remind children that they are the light that they it's it's up to them to carry the light forward into the next generation um because you know regardless of what side of the aisle you land on i think we can all agree that that was a very dark time <laughs> just um as a people, we weren't united. And, and I think we that's still carrying over to today. Um, but she looked at this book as a, as a healing tool for these kids who really just, you know, it's hard for them to understand um, what's going on, what their parents are so upset about, what they're, um, what's being talked about. And she, she put this, she wrote this beautiful poem about, about how, how kids have the power to also rise up and shine their light. And um, we, I know that we, um, we, it was originally just called shine. And then we said, no, I think it needs to be rise and shine because we needed that action word in there. Um, and you know, the, as you can see in this book, it's, and it's just a beautiful, a beautiful book, but the, the artwork is so colorful, so vibrant, so bright. So it really does just live up to the, to the message in the book itself. Um, you know, Ara was really a, one thing that I think is, is really cool about her book, if we can kind of just transition to talking a little bit about um, how she got it out into the world. She was really able to harness a grassroots marketing effort with her book. Um, she was lucky in that she had, she already had an audience um, with her artwork because she, she was a full-time artist um, at this point. But, you know, it, it wasn't a massive audience, but, but she had a, a decent audience. Um, and she launched a, a crowdfunding campaign through Kickstarter as a way to pre-sell her book. And so we carried her through the production stages. Um, and then once her book was all designed and you know the artwork was all complete, um, it was a, a perfect reflection of that mission to carry that light forward and, and show kids how to do that. Um, she launched this crowdfunding campaign to pre-sell her book. And she was able to raise, I think, $22,000, um, which reimbursed entirely her production costs and allowed her to print 5,000 books. Um, and she reached out to me earlier this year for a reprint. As, so I know that she's been able to sell through those. This book came out in 2017. Um, and, and she's still doing things with it. Um, so, and just an example of how the production you know, filtering the, the the mission of the book into the production decisions. You can see she's got these beautiful, like sparkly foil stars all over the cover. So it really just embodies that idea of shining. And um, I mean, it, yeah, it, it reflects, it's beautiful. Um, yeah. So that's Ara's story. Um, and I know that she would probably share a lot more about it, but do you want to jump in, Roseanne? And I, I talk about Ara a lot because um, her, if you were ever, you know, pre-COVID, but you know, when you would walk into your favorite gift shop in the Twin Cities, it, you will always see Ara's book there. It's, it's prominently displayed. And she was in, um, uh, what is that adorable art in Linden Hills, um, very prominently displayed there. So no, it was what, um, not heartfelt. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been that long since I left. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so 
she's she's been one of those authors who has um, really embraced the idea of yes, she is um, she has published this book, but again, the book is an extension of her and not the other way around, and so. She, she's going at, she's speaking as an artist, as a poet, um, as a children's book author, sure, but she's going to, to um, you know, she's thinking outside of the box when it comes to where to display her book, where her audience might be, um, where, where people might, might stumble upon her beautiful book and, and be reminded that they should have a copy. Um, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm sure we don't have to speak to the importance of having a beautiful children's book. Um, because if you're going to do it, you know, you're competing against a lot of really, really beautiful children's books. And so, you know, whatever you need to do to make it so you are working with the very best illustrators and interior designers and all that good stuff, that's what, that's what Wisink is amazing at. And, and that it really makes all the difference. Um, well, one thing that I think is also just worth noting about Ara's book is that her crowdfunding campaign was as much for marketing the book, it was part of her launch plan as much as it was for funding. Yes, she needed the funding, but it actually ended up also then being a tool for her to, to, um, to get the word out. Um, and she decided to forego traditional distribution 100%. So yes, her book is in, is in gift shops and in art shops across the Twin Cities, and she sells a lot directly on her website, but she is not in Ingram. She is not in um, Barnes and Noble. She her book is on on Amazon, I believe, um, but she's listed it there herself. Um, and that was a very intentional choice because um, she's a full time artist, and she really, you know, this is her this is her job, this is her career. So she's like, I really can't afford to give Amazon. You know, or Barnes and Noble, 55% of the cover price on every copy. I really need to go outside of the traditional um, outlets in order to, to make this worth it for me so that I can keep doing more of this work. Um, so I thought you know, that that's something worth sharing as well. Um, and then I just wanna bring, I've got two more, <laughs> two more books to share. Um, I'll save, I'll save uh, Dara's for last. <laughs> Uh, my my beautiful business partner is in the process of launching her children's book um, that is all about purpose as well. But um, you know, this is a book that we that we did with a nonprofit here in the Twin Cities, um, and it's called When Everything Was Everything, and it's the the very first um, Lao American children's book um, that's been published. And you know, one of the things that we really hold, you know, a value that we hold near and dear is publishing books with representation. And um, for kids to be able, those Lao kids to be in the, you know, largely in Minnesota, to be able to see themselves in these stories, um, you know, that's everything. You can't see, and it's this is a Minnesota story, um, so much as you know, as much as it is uh, a Lao American story. And so I also think it's it's important for for kids whose families um, have been here for many more generations to be reminded that our demographic graphics are um, are changing and to see each other, you know, and it, it builds bridges of empathy and, and connection. Um, and so that's just a, another special book that yeah, I wanted I to share. Yeah, I love that book so much. And I, I I feel like there's another thing that you just reminded me when you showed it. Um, I felt like the author did a totally amazing job of, of launching that book. Mm -hmm. um, what happened, the, I, I remember now, of course, again, we're, we're not in a time where we can do exactly this, but I remember there being food trucks and there being um, a very purposeful effort around a social media cam campaign. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'll, I'm the first one to admit um, I, I've had it with social media and I'm just really not interested on, in being there if I don't have to be. Um, but I think what um, the author did really well with that book is um, use uh, social media, I believe it was Instagram that she was on that she just was posting these beautiful images from her book, uh, a quick passage, um, and just using that as, you know, again, we keep talking about um, being intentional and, and staying focused on your mission. So instead of just, you know, oh, I'm launching an ad campaign or, you know, I need to hurry up and get this many followers. It was really like, 
you know, this is the, the platform that I can use that will really showcase what, what I'm trying to say here. Um, and then organically, it sort of grew from there. So I think she's a really good example of an author who's, um, who kind of understands that long haul of um, the children's book efforts, um, all the book efforts, but, you know, maybe especially a children's book that um, is very purpose driven. Absolutely. -driven. And, you know, in addition to being beautiful, um, the, the authors of this book um, it got some really wonderful um, endorsements you know, one from Kalia Yang, um, you know, and so, and several others. And that is so important too for, you know, especially if you're really going to be um, focusing on grassroots efforts and trying to open doors outside of the traditional um, book retail channels, you know, to have really great endorsements that will help open those doors is really important. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about your second book, Roseanne, and the mission behind that one and how that one came um, about? Sure. So um, my <laughs> second book is, is um, it's called Edge the Bear Garden, and it, um, it is, uh, it's much shorter than my first book and took me tw twice as long to write. And it was partially because um, it, it was about the, the subject of cyberbullying and di digital citizenship and um, stuff that I feel very strongly about and I really wanted to get it right. Um, and for me, uh, you know, the marketing efforts behind that book and putting myself out there were, were very different uh, than the first. The first had a, a much more, more kind of feel good uh, message to it. Um, so with that second one, there was a lot more um, intention behind, um, well, just getting deeper into sparking some of these conversations. So um, with both of my books, I have um, guided reading um, questions at the end of each chapter. Um, for a while, I have since taken it down from my website, but for a while I had um, a downloadable um, teacher's guide to use for the book. Um, you know, if they were teaching it in a class, um, I was part of a, a bunch of different book clubs. You know, it was, it was interesting because um, what I found was that that um, with that book being very, it wasn't, a, it, it wasn't a personal story, it was fiction, but because it was going to elicit such personal um, commentary and, and really kind of intense conversation, I felt like, like it was more, it, it was necessary for me to um, kind of make that my connections with teachers and book clubs and all that good stuff um, much more personal. So uh, that's what I did with that book. I think this is a really good example, though, of how you took a mission with the book and translated it into, okay, here's this mission. What is the problem that it's solving? And how do I take this mission and find a solution um, through the marketing of this book so that I can, I can achieve that? So when you look at the, you know, you, you could have you could have probably taken this to, to, to libraries and to Barnes and Noble and done events there and, and done things like that. But instead you built a lesson plan because your mission was to help spark great conversations. And what is a problem that teachers ha oftentimes have? They, they need to fill up an hour with, with teaching <laughs> with, with a great lesson, right? And so you, you know, being a teacher, you were able to, to solve that problem for the people who would be a funnel for the book. Um, and as a result, that lesson plan also did spark the conversations that you wanted to have. I think there's another important thing that I just want to um, mention about that book, though. I know that, uh, you know, your main character, um, you never say, you know, what, what sex or gender that, that main character is throughout the book. Um, and similar to, you know, when everything was everything, um, you know, young people just need representation. And I think, you know, for, for non-binary people, young people to be able to see themselves in that character, that's, I think, a really important yeah. submission of that book. I, it's, it's funny that you say that because I, I just felt, I didn't, uh, to be totally honest, I didn't put a lot of thought into what that meant. What I, what I really wanted was to have a main character that everybody could relate to. And instead, it, when I say everybody, I mean every you know, seventh grader reading the book would relate to. And instead of trying to 
um, you know, like a jigsaw puzzle forcing in a bunch of, well, you know, their hair color will be this, but their eye color will be this and their skin color will be this. I figured, you know, it might be kind of fun to play with having the kids decide what the gender of this narrator is. And I will tell you in my conversations with kids, um, that was, and, and still is the number one question that I get about it. And, and kids get like angry. Like I will, you know, they'll say like, no, but really, was it a boy or a girl, you know, and I'll, and I will share, you know, like actually, you know, when I was writing it, I was picturing a boy and I've had plenty of kids be like, no, it was definitely a girl. Like they'll argue with me about my own book that I wrote. And, and to me, that feels like I've done something right. Um, because that really was the response mm -hmm. I was trying to elicit. Well, and it, it just shows that um, just by making that one editorial choice, you did spark those conversations um, and 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 passions and um, and also have them you you allowed them to question their need for these for these these boundaries and for these um, you know clear identities and you know I think that young people especially kind of crave mm -hmm. that they want to know what something is and you know and that's what it is right and so. Um, you know, getting them to be right. a little uncomfortable <laughs> with that, Definitely. I think is really useful. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, I did want to just talk a little bit about um, my business partner's book and what she is doing right now. Um, you know, a few years ago, her, um, her daughter was wanting to dress up as a princess. This was maybe two years ago. And she went to the store and looked at all the princess dresses. And um, if you know Dara Beavis, um, she's an African-American woman. Her husband is from Jamaica. And so um, her daughter is Jamaican, African-American <laughs> and um, you know, a, a beautiful young girl. And she um, you know, wasn't able to find any, any princess dresses um, with a little black or brown girl. And so, she, she thought, well, you know, maybe I need to like dig into this a little bit more. And so she, she realized in doing a little research that there are all these African queens that um, are not, um, that are not celebrated, that are, are not really well known. And she wanted to elevate these stories. So she researched these queens and she um, is now coming out with this, this beautiful series called Little Queens, and it is telling the true stories of real African American, African American and, and African Queens. Um, I say, I say that because there's some that, there's one that's in Jamaica, there's one um, that is in the, the continent of Africa, so they're, they're in different places, but she's, these are research stories, these are the real stories, um, they're empowering, um, and she, um, just this past month was able to crowdfund this series and she raised I think over $20,000 for this um, um, just by harnessing the power of of her personal connections um, and that representation is you know is huge it's so important right now and it's also an example of how you can you can connect with a movement that's happening and you know you can figure out a way to align your book with a movement that's already happening with a wave that's already rolling. Um, and you know, th their family was at, was at the heart of the relief efforts this, this past summer um, in Minneapolis. Um, and so it, it really was a, a very natural thing for her to be publishing this book at the same time. And it just, you know, it all just <laughs> happened to, to come together this year. But, but um, yeah, I'm just very proud of her and I'm proud of the book that, that's coming out. So. Um, you can check it out if it, on, I should send the, the link, it's um, on Kickstarter, but if you if you search Little Queens or Little Queens um, on the Kickstarter uh, website, yeah, and you it, can find it. it and is. the art is amazing. Can I, can I talk a little bit about Kickstarter? Because yes, I feel please. like when, it, when we talk about um, creating a movement around a book, whether it's a children's book or not, um, Kickstarter is kind of the gold standard of, of doing that. So I don't know how familiar any of you are with crowdfunding or if you do that already for your authors or if you're thinking about doing it for yourself. Um, but I, I have, 
you, I, I think Dara's campaign is probably a, a, a perfect example of an indie author who has used Kickstarter um, really cleverly and um, obviously successfully. Um, if you have heard about the Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls um, book series, that I say that that is the gold standard for um, Kickstarter campaigns. It's just an absolutely phenomenal success that's led to podcasts and all the other things. And I think, um, you know, in, in the, all the authors that Amy and I worked with over the years, there's um, there tends to be um, this desire to to create the movement on the book that Kickstarter can create um, without quite understanding that it is a huge undertaking to do something like that. So a Kickstarter campaign is very much um, another marketing effort. Um, so it's, it's not something to enter into lightly, um, but knowing that it's there um, as an author or a publisher right now is kind of a game changer because for the right author, for the right book, um, it can really be, um, be powerful. So um, if you're thinking about it or if you have authors who are thinking about it, um, I would say absolutely um, check out as many successful campaigns as you can and um, reach out for help and questions because um, it's it's a big yeah. deal to and, do one of those right. You know, I think the, if you're genuine to your message, um, that's, I mean, that's what makes it successful if, is, is if you can um, speak in a human way about, about what your message is and harness that in your campaign. Um, I did just share Dara's campaign. She's got 51 hours to go and she's at uh, about $21,000. So if you want to be one of the first ones to get it, you can, um, you can still pre-order a copy for the next 51 hours. <laughs> um, but just talking a little bit about in you know, the, the different platforms that our authors use for crowdfunding, um, it really means that, that it, it can be the best of both worlds because they can have their, their project funded and they can um, make all of the profits on the end. So, um, you know, it, that we say that you, you pay to publish one way or another, either you pay up front or you pay um, through royalties in the back end. If a book is crowdfunded, then you really don't pay at all except for with your time. Um, so it can be a really great deal if you, if you're able to build a, a campaign strategically, um, you know, some strategies around that. We always suggest that authors build a campaign after their book is already built. So oftentimes they're reimbursing themselves for the production costs. Um, but what that means is that the book is going to look a lot more developed. You know, people can see that it's a real thing, that it's worth worthy of investing in. Um, and I think the myth early on when crowdfunding was a thing <laughs> or was just becoming a thing, um, you know, the idea that, you know, you would have too much invested or you'd have too many prototypes might suggest to people that you don't really need the money. But I think the opposite is true. It shows that you've got skin in the game and that you, um, and that it's really going to happen. Also, then you can build the momentum from that campaign right into the launch of the book. Because if you can do a campaign in three months before the book actually comes out, you know, go to print right after the campaign is done, um, then there's a lot of momentum that you can tie into it. If there's too big of a gap between when you do the campaign and when the book actually comes out, then you lose that momentum and, and you lose all of the um, all of the great marketing efforts that you've done. Um, and there are a couple of different platforms that we've had authors use. Indiegogo is one other one that we've used other than Kickstarter. Um, Indiegogo is a platform where, um, you know, you don't have to meet your goal in order to have the campaign be successful. Um, you don't get as much uh, organic traffic that way. Um, you'll have fewer people stumbling across your book. Um, and also, I think just psychologically, it might mean that you don't have as much urgency behind it because you know, know that um, you're going to get whatever you make. Um, but it sort of depends on what kind of person you are. I think there's some people who are really motivated by that all or nothing approach, and some people just need to play it a little bit safer. So, yeah. And I, so I, like I said, I did just share the campaign, but um, anything that you want to add? To that, Roseanne? Um, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I've, I there were a couple questions that um, I didn't 
get to. I'm just seeing them now on the side. Paul, would you like me to, would you like us to go through some? Yeah, of if you're spotting them and answering them, otherwise <clears throat> I can ask them for you. There, there's one actually I'll pop in here right now that related to Kickstarter is, um, is it something that you guys would recommend for people doing their first book or um, is it better if they already have one book sort of under their belt and have learned? Yeah, I would say that about. doesn't matter. Um, it's it's more important that the book be, um, you know, as Amy said, kind of complete and, or at least close to complete with illustrations and beautiful visuals. I think people care less about how many books you've published and more the quality of the product. Yeah, I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, just some strategies around how we market those campaigns, you know, we always suggest that, you know, we, we, we ask people to look at it as, as a pre-sale truly rather than a, a charity, you know, give me money so that I can do achieve my dream. It's more like, okay, now I'm releasing this, you know, you can be one of the first ones to purchase it. Here's a need that, that this book is filling and really focusing on, um, on the problem that the book is solving and, um, and the mission behind it. Um, and, you know, we always say, you know, try to launch it on a Friday, have your list of your sure bet people <laughs> um, that you can reach out to right when the book or when the campaign goes live, have them donate first and then make it go um, public that following Monday so that there's a weekend where your, your top people will be contributing so that, uh, you know, it, nobody wants to be the very first. <laughs> People are happy to be the last, but they don't want to be the first. So, um, and they also want to contribute to something that actually is um, is popular that has momentum. So, you know, if you can get if you can get people to contribute right off the bat, um, that's always better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and that is again an example of how you know if you're creating a Kickstarter campaign, you you certainly have the potential to create a movement, but it is not something to enter into lightly. There's a lot of intention that has to go behind that. And any of you who have published books before know that, you know, the three months before your book comes out can be a little, you know, stressful. So you have to just be, understand what you're getting into, keep your sense of humor about you um, and kind of enjoy that, that process too, of, of leading people to yeah. your movement. On um, a few other things that we've learned about how to build rewards and, and how to run a Kickstarter. Um, you know, one thing that we oftentimes suggest is find a par partner that um, that also aligns with your mission. If your book is, is uh, you know, filling a, is part of a, a specific movement, find a nonprofit maybe that is also supporting that movement. And maybe you can do a buy one, give one or do a, a classroom package or something like that, that so that if, if people want to contribute at a higher level, they can feel like they're, you know, you know, let's, for example, I had one book that um, they had a, a classroom gift package for an under-resourced an under -resourced school, and they partnered with a nonprofit that could distribute those um, the classroom package to that under-resourced school. So it lended credibility to the project, um, and it also meant that the nonprofit would talk about it in their newsletter. So it's also taking advantage of another marketing tool, um, riding the coattails of another, of another, um, of another platform essentially, um, so that you can get the word out further. And really looking at, you know, where are shared audiences? You know, um, I just realized that I probably should have said this earlier, but um, I do have a free resource for all of you. I'm gonna put it in the chat now. So um, uh, we have a course at Evergreen Authors about how to create a successful crowdfunding campaign for your book. Um, it's free. Um, so you are welcome to you know, take a look and see if there's anything in there. It, it kind of answers some of these basic questions about crowdfunding and how it can work for you and how to choose the right platform and all that other stuff. So you know, feel free to check it out. So you may address this already there, but um, Holly raised a good question. If, if the book's done, 
And given that Kickstarter is taking a cut of whatever you earn, what's really the advantage of, of using Kickstarter to take pre-orders? I think there's just urgency behind it. You know, they do take, I think, 7%. Is that right, Sam? That sounds right. I think I it's 7 I, I think they exact, take, yeah. yeah, I think they, they take 7%. But um, what's great about it is that because it's a campaign, because it's for a limited time, it creates urgency in the minds of the people who would be contributing or who would be pre-ordering. You're also going to have targeted rewards that are, are packaged. So, you know, the first one would be just a copy of the book itself, but then there's the, like a buy one, give one to a friend. There's, there's some larger packages. So it's sort of motivates people to contribute more than they would otherwise, where, you know, if they're going to just pre-order from your website, well, they, they might just pick up one copy of the book. You're probably not going to make as much as you would in a Kickstarter campaign. But I've even had authors, um, this has happened, I think only one time, um, but there was, a, there was one author who was so close to her goal. She it was about $2,000 away. It was a $10,000 goal. She'd raised $8,000 and, you know, she had to call in a friend to put in the extra 2000 and she reimbursed that friend through the, through the funds for the campaign. But at the end of the day, she still raised $8,000. And so she was much better off doing the campaign than she would have been, even though she needed a pinch hitter at the last moment <laughs> to get over the finish line. So, um, but it would have been it would have been different, I think. I think had she had she just been selling on our website, I don't think that yeah, she would have. Yeah, we talk had about that a lot, actually. About, um, about this idea that you know when your book launches, unless you're like already Stephen King or some sort of like famous person, the chances are the people who are going to you know support you are the ones who are going to buy your book no matter what. They love you. They they want to see you succeed. And so a Kickstarter campaign gives them a chance to do that in a very substantive way, you know, not just buying one book, but buying a class set, you know, or a, a set for their favorite daycare center or um, something like that. And a Kickstarter, it's, it's, um, or any of the, if you build a book, you, you really are at an advantage because these crowdfunding platforms are so visual. So it's very hard to, to crowdfund a, a straight up fiction book that is just text, um, but with a children's book, you have beautiful visuals, you can have music, you can have coloring pages, you can have stickers, tattoos, you know, all these wonderful mm -hmm. rewards that go along with it. Um, and, you know, we've seen authors do these uh, all kinds of different ways. And so, um, you know, you can use that to your advantage. I think it's also important to remember that people want to help, but they don't always know what, how to help and they're probably not going to stretch their minds to think of how to help unless they're a very very special person and so <laughs> the crowdfunding campaign actually says here are the specific ways that you can help and it makes it really easy for, for them there all, are all of these suggestions for how much they can give at these different levels and um you know i i think it's just a great way to package it so that it makes that decision simple but they're also they're also paying for something it's also a, a it's an exchange of goods essentially you know um they're you're giving them back equal value mm -hmm. i think there was another like, question on here yeah. oh yeah there's several questions yeah sorry so i, I guess uh, during away from a little bit of the tail end more to the, the front end of the process um, Rodden raised a good question, and I think this is worth addressing, is um, not all children's book authors are illustrators, mm -hmm. like in Ara's case. Mm -hmm. I know Dara used another illustrator. Can you talk about that, sort of the, the author, author slash illustrator, author plus illustrator, that sort of oh, Sure, yeah, I can talk to that. Um, you know, most of our authors um, are not illustrators. Ara is kind of a, a special case. And so I thought that's why, you know, that's why I brought her, on. I was going to bring her on to the, to the conversation because I thought, oh, that's kind of neat. She's got both sides of this <laughs> that she can bring to the table. Luckily, Roseanne is, you know, a brilliant marketer as well. So she's got a lot to bring to the table. But, um, you know, when, it, when we're choosing an illustrator, um, we're, we're really thinking about what is the, what is the vibe and the essence of the book um, that we want to get across. And we have um, a, a few different agencies that we work with that have illustrators all over the world. And so um, it allows us to 
have a lot of variety with our illustrators and have a lot of options for, for the authors. So how we go about that is um, we have the author actually build a Pinterest board first of different illustration or children's books and, and illustrators that they like different aesthetics and art styles and then we share that with with our agency representatives and um, sometimes we actually will source people on on Instagram like we'll do some research for um, individual illustrators on Instagram just to see if we can find somebody who's local or, or find somebody to work with directly um, I'm actually writing a children's book right now uh, all about forest foraging and I it was really important to me that I have a, a local Minnesota artist because that way, you know, that's somebody who could do events with me. Um, you know, I wanted to be able to say that this is a Minnesota built book 100%, you know, it's gonna be, you know, obviously written in, by a Minnesotan, illustrated by a Minnesotan, um, published by a Minnesotan, printed by a Minnesota printing company. Um, and so I wanted to, to that to be part of my marketing as well. Um, sort of a celebration of our of our state also. Um, so I found somebody on Instagram that that I'm going to be hiring. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that you can find a great illustrator. Um, but you know, I think the quickest way is to is to work with an agency. One of the agencies we work with um, is called Astound. And you know, they they have hundreds of beautiful illustrators around the world. So we've hired illustrators illustrators in Argentina, we've hired illustrators in Peru, in Vietnam, um, in Spain, uh, um, all through this, this wonderful agency. And I might point out as a designer, design and illustration are different things, they're different skills, and usually, but not always different people. So there's, there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle. But I have had that happen before where people will uh, talk about about that and it's like no no you don't want me drawing your book that would be very sad oh Sorry, i feel state. like you said that so so nicely and that is just something that we we say all the time to authors i i know that you know unless that person is an artist um i know amy and i have had many conversations where we're like oh gosh who's gonna have this hard talk about how there needs to be a different illustrator than, than the writer and that's but it's a real thing because i think that partnership we've seen partnerships between uh, writers and illustrators who didn't know each other before and then are able to use each other's networks to sell their books uh, doubly um, it happen all the time. So that's something really exciting if you're not a visual artist like, like I certainly mm -hmm. am not. So. No, that's, that's a very good point, kind of doubling your effort, mm -hmm. doubling your audience. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, Karen raises a good question here about um, <clears throat> marketing, especially if you're self-publishing. Uh, um, what do you recommend for marketing to uh, small stores or gift stores or any bookshops, things like that? I mean, how do you, how do you get to all these people short of going door to door? <laughs> well, so I put in the chat a, a resource that we have at Evergreen Authors called, um, uh, it's, it's author templates. We call it our little black book of templates. And, um, you know, I wish that there was some sort of way that, you know, everybody could just put their book into their favorite gift shop without making a, a personal connection. But the truth is, um, there isn't, you know, the, the, the bottom line is it, having these gift shops, um, especially the local ones um, with really vibrant, creative communities like in the Twin Cities, um, they are asked to hold, you know, sell books and, and people's crafts and, and wares all the time. Um, so the way that you really get your book featured in these types of places is, is through uh, reaching out. Um, and so that's why we created these templates um, to, to have, um, you know, authors who are just looking for, you know, how can yeah. I, how can I reach out in a way that's not cheesy? Like, how do I, how do I draft an email? How how do I pick up the phone? Um, so I, I really do think that's the way and it, it leads to kind of a bigger conversation about how uh, partnerships are really the key when it comes to selling any book, no matter what the genre, but probably particularly with a children's book, because again, you're marketing to parents and grandparents who are buying these books. You're really not marketing to kids. You're writing for the kids, um, but you're marketing yeah. to their parents. So 
you want to be where they are. I will say that Pinterest is um, such an underutilized tool when it comes to book marketing. Oh, I should put another resource in the chat for you. Um, I'll do that in a second, but we have a, a, a free um, webinar that we did about how dressed as an author. Um, I obviously, you know, I'm my book marketed toward kids and then I, I wrote a, a book for teachers as well. Um, but, but I know that teachers and parents are on Pinterest. So a lot of my marketing strategy is on Pinterest and it drives a lot of sales for me. So um, I'll put that in the chat yeah. so you guys can watch I, that too. I, I'm reminded of a story this this connects to a story um, that I maybe have shared with you, Roseanne, but um, a few summers ago, Dara and I went to um, the Yale Publishing course um, for leadership strategies and book publishing. And it was really wonderful. I re highly recommend it to any of you. Um, you know, it was a mix of leadership lectures from Yale Business School professors and um, instructors. Um, and industry professionals um, at the highest level in, in publishing, um, the levels in publishing. And we had this really wonderful um, kind of masterclass on book marketing where they walked us through the marketing from you know marketing directors at Penguin Random House and Simon and Schuster. They had one from each. Um, and they took us to through two case studies and we got to the part about getting endorsements. And I said, so, you know, is there a secret network <laughs> that we should be a part of? Like, is there a, um, you know, like a job posting board where you ask people for, for, for endorsements? Like, how do you go about that? And I said, well, we write love letters and, and just beg and do that for to about a hundred different people. And I was like, oh, so it really isn't magic. <laughs> And that's kind of what um, I, I can take away and apply to a lot of different areas. And I think that applies to the gift shops and, and these other small specialty retail, retail um, places. You know, I think that it's, it's great to connect with places like that for marketing your book because you can usually be a big fish in a small pond. Um, they usually have smaller book sections and and the, the short store owners are typically trying to make a personal connection. And if you can appeal to that, then, then you've got a great, a great chance. Um, one resource that I've had authors use in the past is called New Leaf um, Distribution. And they distribute to gift shops and spirituality um, shops um, throughout the country. So that is one that that is really specific to gift shops, but they really are looking for um, books in the more spiritual realm, I would say. Yeah. I mean, I, I Amy knows how I feel about um, targeted advertising, because I feel like, um, you know, there are two major search engines when it comes to where people are looking for books. Um, and especially, you know, if you get your mind, you put yourself in the mind of a, a parent or a teacher who's looking for the content of your children's book or e even the, the exact mission of your children's book, they're using Amazon and they're using Pinterest as the search engines that they are. You know, you just have that search toolbar. We use it all the time. Um, you know, you go to Amazon books about um, books featuring diverse children, um, books about um, teaching kids empathy. And what, you know, the reality is, is with so many books coming out every single day, you wanna have a really targeted keyword strategy. So when people are searching for your content, they find it. And um, I find that, you know, there's, a, there's so much joy for me in doing the teaching and the workshops and all that stuff, but there's a whole lot of joy as well that comes from passive income with your book sales because you've really um, sold your book to people who are already looking for the content. So I know Paul's already listened to us talk about that ad nauseum, but um, we feel pretty passionately about it, so. It's a good lesson to keep beating in, Rosanna. <laughs> I keep trying. <laughs> well, and it's, you know, we kind of alluded to this. And I think it's, it's one of the toughest things, especially for new publishers, is that they're looking for the, mm -hmm. the silver bullet, the, the magic dust that, you know, you sprinkle this on and the book just goes out into the world. 
And unfortunately, there isn't any. It's it's shoe leather. It's, it's making calls. It's sending emails. It's doing all of that work yeah. over and over and over again. So I'm glad you kind of emphasized that, that point here. <clears throat> one, one question, I guess, to follow on with that, how, how would you compare marketing, um, I guess, in general producing, but also marketing children's books versus other fiction or nonfiction genre books? I mean, what what's better, what's worse, what's different? Is Pinterest a good thing for either? Or is that really no. on children's? Things like that. Well, I, I would say Pinterest is, uh, the main audience on Pinterest is going to be uh, teachers and uh, um, mainly women, to be honest. So moms are on there more. Um, so, you know, I, I would say Pinterest is great for cookbooks. It's great for um, children's books. It's great for anything in the education space. Um, you know, any nonfiction book is going to be uh, better promoted on a platform like LinkedIn, most likely. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, and then Amazon is kind of the, the one that is, you know, it's the search engine for all. Yeah. Um, but I know that, you know, you've had a lot of success with Amazon ads and Josie, your business partner, has had, who's also a wise income author um, has had a lot of success with Amazon ads. So that's, it's one way to help your book rise to the surface on Amazon. Uh, um, you know, it's, it's not perfect. And I think that that is getting a little more saturated um, because the more people who, who use Amazon ads, the, it, you know, it dilutes their power. Um, it's a little bit harder to, so you, you, you know what Amazon ads are when you see on the bottom, it says sponsored um, products related to this one. So, um, we've had, had a lot of authors use that and have success with it. Um, you know, it's, but it's, it's not perfect. And I think it's, it's starting to lose its effective. I would, and you, you know, Amazon is always kind of messing with their algorithm. So, which is, which is why it's important to be kind of, um, smart about it before you dive into it. But, you know, I think that's why we're so excited about Pinterest because we're not seeing that type of saturation there. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, if you're writing children's books, that's really just a great place for you to be. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all the more reason to get really intentional behind some of this other work, this other marketing work as well. Um, and, you know, again, I think this goes to something really fundamental that a lot of authors forget. And that is, uh, um, you know, you need to get your, your head in the mind of whoever it is that you're getting. So mm -hmm. if you don't if you've written a book and you don't know your audience, um, there's, there's a, there's a problem. You, you need to spend some time getting to know your audience. And so, you know, I mean, I've seen authors literally go on their LinkedIn page and say, Hey guys, I've written in this business book. Where do you buy books? Where do you, where do you get your information? What websites do you go to? And then they use that to, Oh, that's a great connection for me. I there, you know, the, I, I don't, sometimes authors can be, um, um, they can make, get harder on themselves by doing the guesswork on their own, or they say, oh, you know, I, I think every, I think people are buying books based on blog posts. Well, if they don't have any evidence of that and they read it somewhere on Twitter, that might not be a really effective way for you to sell books. And so, you know, for me, if I'm targeting teachers or if I'm targeting, um, uh, you know, bookstores or, or anything like that, I need to know where they are getting their information and how I can get in those places, yeah. if that makes any sense. I think key to getting into into your reader's head is really understanding, you know, what keeps them up at night. What is the what is their life like? What is what are the problems that they are facing, and how is your book part of the solution? And if your book isn't directly a part of the solution, figure out how you can build a tool that goes with your book so that it can be part of the um, teaching guide for mm -hmm. for teachers. You know. It, Yes, teachers need content for, for their classes, but just giving them the book isn't enough. You need to build something else so that their problem is solved by yeah. buying it. I will say, I mean, creating the, the teacher's guide for, for my first book was the absolute game changer for me because it meant that I was providing more value than just the book. It was here's a lesson plan as well. And it wasn't just something that I put together. It was, you know, I'm a certified teacher. I know that this will work. I, you know, 
Um, so I had kind of that, um, the credential behind me to do that, so to speak. But there are a lot of different ways that you could, that you could do that. And, um, you know, one example I can, I can think of that, um, for a book that <laughs> just solved this problem itself. You know, we, we coach a lot of authors to go to funnels for where their readers are congregating. Um, so one of the books that we published um, back in 2017, I think is when it came out. Um, it's called My Preemie Baby Book. And this was a book that was written for um, by two, two parents who um, had twin daughters in the NICU. These girls were born at 23 weeks and six days. And if you know anything about preemies, um, 24 weeks is what they say is minimum viability. These two little girls are well and thriving, and I think they're seven years old now. Um, so it's a it's a really happy story. Um, it wasn't without a roller coaster, of course. But from this, they learned that there really wasn't a baby book for preemies and preemie specific milestones. And so so they wrote this beautiful book that is tracking these things, but it's also an emotional tool to carry the parents through the journey. It's also a journal so that they can actually capture the story and remember it because it is such a such a whirlwind. And then it becomes a tool for them to, to share the story with th their kids later on. Um, and what they have done is also decided to, they decided to forego the traditional distribution route altogether, and they went directly to the hospitals. And they started with the NICU that they were in um, with their daughters, and that NICU bought um, several hundred copies for all of their um, new NICU families. And then it went from that one hospital to the hospital system, and then another hospital system picked it up. And so it does, it takes time, and it does take effort, and it takes cold calling and it takes cold emailing and it takes relationship building. But all in all, you know, they're able to make a lot more money through the sale of their book and going directly to the people who need it, finding that funnel, that direct funnel to their audience, finding where they're congregating, where if they, you know, focused on libraries and bookstores, they'd be selling, you know, one here, one there, just praying that their perfect reader or, um, you know, the secondary audience, the family member who would want to purchase it as a gift, just praying that they would walk into the bookstore and find it. Um, and instead, they just made it a simple solution for the hospital. You know, the hospital looks good because they're giving this beautiful book to all of these patients and these families, right? They look compassionate. So they're sol solving a marketing problem for the hospital. And they are they're filling this need and going directly to their audience. So that's that's a way that we're coaching people to to think about it. And uh, with children's books, especially, you know, there are opportunities to do that. Um, and going to where parents are congregating, going to where grandparents are congregating, and mm -hmm. teachers are congregating. So we've had a couple of questions that are more on the the business side of things. So let's maybe kind of turn toward mm -hmm. that. One is um, Victoria was asking about where to find out about industry averages, like by genre, about how sales do go, how sales should go. I guess the question is in context mm -hmm. of you're trying to gauge, you know, am I doing well or not? And I think you just kind of outlined it. It depends a lot on how you're trying to market it and who you're trying to go to. But um, I guess having said that, where do you turn to for that sort of you know, industry-wide statistical information. Is there can a place? I, can, I'm can trying I, to think if IBPA has that kind of stuff, but I don't, I can't yeah, think of Yeah, I, I would like love that. to answer this first, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this with love in my heart. Um, I, I don't look at that stuff for the same reason I don't have a scale in my house. And the reason is, I'm not interested what that number says, because if I look at that number, then it's going to mess with my head. I'm going to be like, well, I shouldn't, you know, I feel pretty strongly that um, authors shouldn't be comparing their sales to anyone else's. Um, it's just a really great way to make yourself go completely insane. So if that does exist, um, save yourself and don't look at it. <laughs> well, that's a good point, because I would imagine, you know, if you're looking at like uh, Publisher Weekly or something they're talking about <clears throat> trade books the big the big publishers who are selling them by the thousands literally by the truckload 
Um, and that will always make you as an indie publisher. Yeah, feel and everybody's inadequate. so different. I remember how having a meeting with um, a Wise Inc. author once who was just absolutely lovely. And he was telling me that he had done this Barnes and Noble book signing and it was just a disaster. And he just couldn't believe what a terrible day it was. And it was so traumatic for him and he never wanted to do it again. And I just thought, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And then right at the end of the conversation, he said, yeah, I only sold like 85 books. And I remember thinking, dude, like I can name 20 authors who would have killed to sell 85 books in one afternoon. That's because success is gauged very differently based on the person. And so again, and you know, if you get into that comparison game, I just think it's um, not a game that you want to play. <laughs> yeah. Um, and like you were saying, these these traditional publishers, they these large traditional publishers, the big five, they they purchase space at the front of those bookstores, and they don't, you know. But they also, even if you get a traditional publishing deal, um, you might not be their frontline author, and they do, you know, they pick a few titles every year to be, be like their big blockbusters, and then the rest are you know, just destined to be backlist sooner than later. And, and, you know, you might get a publicist that they else, they'll assign to you. They might schedule an event. They might get you a little bit of PR, but it's, it's not, um, it's even getting a traditional deal isn't a magic bullet. And so authors are, you know, really do need to think about their readers, no matter what, whether you are getting a traditional deal or you're going in and um, really understanding where your readers are, are showing up mm -hmm. um, is key to marketing. Well, and as I think we've seen, even the big five are relying more and more on authors to be bringing their own audience to a book. Mm -hmm. Without Heck, a doubt. He yeah. goes on the circuit to do you know, yeah. book signings and readings. And if anybody has heard of him, I mean, certainly no hope for anybody else. Well, and it's such an interesting world nowadays. You know, we, we've been coaching a lot of authors in into launching books during during quarantine and so um, we really can't rely on in-person events anymore and so our our efforts have largely largely been digital you know people are launching um on social media and they're launching they're having virtual launch parties and that sort of thing but i'm really i'm coaching a lot of authors to be creating content that they can filter to places where their audience is congregating. So, um, you know, we did it on another, another NICU book actually this year for NICU moms and it's just a, a little self-help book or a little inspiration book for those NICU moms. Um, so the author was saying, you know, I just don't know what to do to get my message out there. She said, and you know, because of COVID, you know, I, my PTSD is triggered all of the time because everywhere I go, I smell hand sanitizer and I smell cleaning products because everybody's cleaning everything. And it reminds me of being in the NICU. And I was like, well, write an article about that. So she wrote an article about the, the unseen PTSD of NICU families and what that's like in COVID. And she sent it to Scary Mommy, the blog, and it was published in a day. So, you know, her audience is congregating there and it was a way that she could get her word out there and that she could connect with them um, in a place where they are already showing up without stepping foot into a bookstore so really thinking you know what is happening right now that how can I target my how can I target my um, my content and filter it through this lens of what's happening today and how do I reach my readers and address what problems they're facing today that are unique mm -hmm. to today. Okay, so Suzanne's raised a good question, um, mm -hmm. more on the production side, the, the, the happy world where I get to live. Um, pointing out that a lot of children's books uh, previously been printed overseas and they tend to be, you know, especially if we're talking about the hardcover books, um, they are expensive of production runs. Um, are you guys still seeing that overseas production is is viable, is the way to go? Oh, and if or if not, who are you using for printing books and, and producing children's books you know, here? You no, know, we largely, we do have um, a couple of printers that we have connected with overseas. We actually haven't printed overseas 
these though before we we work with largely midwest printers um so we work with corporate graphics and Mankato, we work with Bang Printing and Brainerd. We work with Friesens. Um, Marquee Printing is another printer in Canada. Uh, they do an, a beautiful job on both hard covers and soft covers. So that's another one to look at. Um, we work with Versa in, in um, that's in Peoria, Illinois. And so largely Midwest printers. Um, and you know, in that case, you know, we built we built these relationships over a long period of time, and it serves us well because we can and we can ask for specific delivery dates, and they're you know, and they'll they'll help us out. And so, are these where if you go overseas, it's a much longer timeline, and um, oftentimes our authors are wanting their book yesterday. So, <laughs> I think always authors want their right. book yesterday. I'm done writing. Where's my yeah. book? <laughs> Um, so when you're talking about those uh, shops, you're talking mainly off largely, printing, right, Amy? So, so you know, cross kind of production runs. We do help people go print on demand as well if they don't have the budget. Um, but some of our authors are choosing print on demand just for distribution and still doing an offset printing for their direct sales. So, um, you know, sometimes that that works well because they just don't want to they don't want to pay for distribution and they don't want to have to deal with return and all of that and so it works for them to upload their book um, just for just so that it's accessible on Amazon but then and they focus the majority of their marketing efforts to grassroots on the ground marketing going to where their readers are that works really and print on, yeah well, I was to say print on typically being then soft cover or because I think soft cover you know, you know hard hard cover but it's very you can yeah, you can do hardcover and you can do children's books on print on demand, but um, with children's books in, in particular, it's just, it's so cost prohibitive. Oftentimes you'll end up actually paying out um, to get your book sold um, with a print on demand and set up. I was just looking in the comments here. Bob mentioned about Warzala. I don't know where Warzala in Wisconsin but having uh -huh. just invested a, a lot of money, I'm assuming in a capital investment because of printing that's coming back from China. It's, and that's, I know, a very tricky thing, especially for small publishers, is that the, the printing world is a, it's a big world and it's a dynamic world. Um, you do have to get multiple quotes. <laughs> things change, paper yeah. change, things like that. Um, so I guess then, I, I guess also in the, in the business sense of things, um, what about the future? Where do you guys see the future of children's books going? Is, is it changing? Is it just steaming ahead? Is it growing? I mean, it's a growing industry. I mean, it's a growing genre for sure. Um, what I'm seeing is that I'm seeing more and more children's books that have a specific agenda attached to them rather than just for entertainment. I'm also seeing trends in um, kind of silly gross children's books <laughs> we actually have two children's books that are silly and gross that are coming out this year um one is called mr poop goes home and the other one is um <laughs> it's called let it rip and it, you can guess what that one's about um <laughs> but you know what's interesting is that even even with those books there is a mission behind it you know it may sound silly but I was talking with the the author, um, her name is Carla Maldonado of the um, Mr. Poop Goes Home book. And, you know, we just laughed. We're, we're just like little five-year-old boys. We just laughed the entire time when we talk because we're talking about poop and it's it's funny. Um, but, you know, I have, um, I have a, an almost six-year-old and I have a two-year-old. And so, you know, my life is pretty inundated with with dealing with with that um i have gone through the potty training exercise and you know it's stressful and so we talked about how her book actually you know it, it's about actually landing i'm sorry this is goes home and where his home is is in the toilet right and so we talked about how this book could be really kind of a funny lighthearted way to bring levity to this actually stressful process that parents and kids have to go through. 
kids are stressed, parents are stressed, and you need to have a little bit of a sense of humor about it. So even though it's it's silly and even though it's gross, it actually does serve a really important function for families um, going through that process. So anyway, yeah. that's just an example of how even like the lightest books, the silliest books can have, you know, a great greater impact beyond yeah and I think just being um, what I'm seeing with um especially with COVID is uh that teachers are getting um very uh creative about how they bring books into the classroom for many years um most teachers were anti-ebook for children's books just because um that's just not the way to do it. And then with COVID and then the library shut down, um, I know that my kids are reading on Epic books and um, books and um, they now have their own Libby app where they can download eBooks um, on, you know, and have their own holds on the library uh, at the library so they can get books that way. Um, there's a lot of interactive books right now that are available for children's books where you, you know, you can press on a picture and there's a sound. Um, so I think that um, really smart children's book authors would be open to um, the e having their book be an ebook and having that be um, used in a classroom in a technological kind of way. Do you have any ideas around how to market to teachers in the in the days of COVID? <laughs> wine. <laughs> Send them wine. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, I. I I think, um, you know, the, what I know from um, certainly from the teacher community now is that um, they do not need a marketing um, campaign and they don't need anything that they need to put any thought into. So if there is a children's book that um, you just want to get into the hands of a certain teacher, um, send it to them with no expectations. Uh, here's a book. Thank you for all you do. Um, or here's a book. If you're interested in um, having me come take over a lesson and you can put your feet up, um, let me know. And here's my number. Um, I think that's going to go much better than taking out an advertisement in, in some sort of educational magazine that no one's reading right now. Just what was the website by. that you used though um, to reach teachers? And it was like a teacher trade lesson, like it was paid to Oh, oh, so teacher, now you're telling all my Sorry. secrets. Amy. Um, <laughs> that's okay. Teachers, <laughs> teachers, pay that's why teachers. We're here. <laughs> teachers pay teachers um, is an amazing website um, for selling teaching um, tools. So if you have a book now, you don't want to sell a fiction on there. You do not want to sell all your, your children's book on there but you can sell an accompany, accompanying lesson plan on there. So teachers are um, going there for materials all the time. I will say that, you know, I've, I've talked about how much I love Pinterest. Um, I mainly have my Pinterest traffic driven to my teachers pay teachers site because I make more money off of book sales that way. Uh, um, and it's, it's passive for me there. But again, you know, you don't want to use it as, you don't want to just throw your book up there it's got to be a teaching resource up there. When you were talking about getting uh, books into the classroom, uh, what about um, curriculum guidelines? Is this not as much of an issue or is this a must have kind of thing? And I know that varies state by state also, which can make things even more tricky. For totally. Um, so I, you know, as a teacher, I'm going to tell you, yes, it matters very much. And um, any Anytime you, anytime someone shows me a lesson plan, I'm going to want to see the state standards that are being um, targeted in the lesson. Um, you know, not, not always if I'm just looking for, you know, essential questions or, or a reader's guide, I, I won't be that stringent, but as a teacher, I'm going to be looking for that. Um, but I also will say, you know, I was trained in California and then taught in in Minnesota as well, um, I have just relocated to Arizona where it's basically the wild west of teaching out or education. Like it's just insane out here. There's a million charter spin, everyone's doing their own thing. Um, private schools are everywhere. So um, in that, you know, I would say here it's probably less stringent just because it's just a different um, approach to ed education. So 
you know, either way, if you're not a teacher um, and you, uh, you don't know how, how to create a lesson plan, um, find a teacher and pay a teacher to create one for you. That would be my advice. That's a good website idea. <laughs> find a teacher and pay a teacher? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they need it, yeah. so that would be good. <laughs> Uh, that is a really good tip. I, I think we've made it through all the questions that were asked here. Just see if anything else is going to pop up, having said that, because that's usually right when people say, oh, wait, I have one more question. But it looks like not, so that's good. All right, well, I think we can kind of start wrapping things up. I, I want to thank Thank you both for, yeah. for agreeing to do this. This was wonderful, wonderful information. Um, tremendously useful, especially Roseanne having to jump in and pinch hit here no at the problem. last second. That was good. Um, but thank you, Amy, for coordinating <laughs> that whole thing. Um, yeah, of course. This afternoon, you sounded a little panicked, and I know it takes a lot to pay. <laughs> Wait, so. when Amy calls, I answer every time. That's how much I love Bless her. you. <laughs> and really, you were the perfect person to to jump in here and to be able to share about your education experience and, and all of that. So perfect on topic. Yeah. I, I <laughs> Thank you. Put, uh, uh, put ours um, website in the, the chat. Um, so I do hope people check out her book and her work also. I mean, she's a wonderful artist and I, I told her when she's feeling better, we're definitely going to still still talk because I want to hear her, her her whole story as well.